Good morning, church. I hope you're having a blessed day today. So before we get started in the Word, I want to go over a few announcements. And if you, you should already know by now, we have our Faith Conference coming up. It's a Faith Conference Summer 2022. That is going to be June 24th, 25th, and 26th. It's the night of the 24th, two sessions on the 25th, the morning of the 26th. So all the information is on the website, it's on the Instagram, the Facebook. We've put out a lot of information about it. We'd love for you to attend. We will be at the Harold Washington Cultural Center in uh, on 47th and King Drive at 4701 South Martin Luther King. So we'd love to have you come out. We're at four sessions. We are going to be teaching the Word of Faith. We are going to be just moving with the spirit of god and seeing what god wants to do so we'll probably be doing some healing deliverance we're going to be praying for uh, salvation we're going to be we're going to just be moving with god whatever god wants to do we want to be a part of it so we're going to be doing our our our, our semi-annual faith conference so if you didn't know we do these two times a year this one's coming up next month it's a little less than 30 days away and then the next time we're gonna do it is at the end of the year. So we do it in the summer, in the winter. This is the end of our discipleship cycle and we are gonna start our new discipleship program about a week after that. So we're gonna have some more information coming out. We're gonna make sure we get everybody registered so you can be a part of the discipleship classes coming up also. So a lot, lot of good stuff coming out. Big thing is just make sure you can attend the faith conference. Um, if you would like to sew into that, if you want to, if you want to give to help support the conference, there is a place on the website for that. We'd love and we'd really appreciate it if you want to do that. And then your tithes and offerings. So, church, we always got to remember that it's a give and receive. It's not a give and take. So you give, we receive because you sow, we plant. You sow your seed, we plant your seed, and we watch God bring an increase in your life. So just please make sure that you are sowing into the kingdom of God because the Bible does say give and it shall be given unto you. Give measure, press down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. With the same measure that you meet, the same percentage that you give, it will be measured back unto you. And God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And this is kingdom law, that if you sow, you reap. You sow financially, you will reap financially. The book of Malachi talks about when you give your tithes, the Lord will rebuke the devourer on behalf of you off your harvest. So if you want God to bring an increase financially, if you want that financial provision, that financial blessing in your life to be in abundance, then you must sow. Sowing is the only kingdom principle that produces 30, 60, 100 fold increase back. And we want to make sure that you are blessed in the area of finances. So I have a link on the description, just as always, blankslateministries.org slash sow. We don't have give on there. We have sow because we really want you to understand that you are sowing seed to be able to reap a harvest. So that's all the big announcements. Like I said, we got the faith conference coming up, so just please make sure you attend. We've got the whole auditorium already rented out. You can give to that if you have questions. Uh, if you may like to volunteer, we're going to have some volunteer income available too. All of that's on the website. You're more than welcome to reach out. There's a question block if you have any questions. And then, like I said, please make sure that you are sowing into the kingdom. We do appreciate it. It is not for our benefit that you sow, it is for yours. We just want to make sure that you are blessed of the Lord. If you're not sowing, you're not going to reap. So we want to make sure that you are sowing into the kingdom of God. So I'm going to pray right now for your seed as you sow, and then we're going to get started. So Father, I thank you right now for the seed sown. I pray that every listener is blessed in Jesus' name. Father, we pray that this seed produces 30, 60, 100-fold return, and that the same measure that they measure is that the same measure it will be measured back unto them. And Father, I pray that they are blessed, that you rebuke the devourer on behalf of them from off their harvest. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, church, 
let's get started. So we got all week we've been talking about our father Abraham. So Abraham is what's called the father of faith. He's the patriarch. He's the he's the guy that started it all. So today what we're gonna do, we're gonna take a, a kind of in-depth look. We're gonna do it rather quickly than we normally do it. I'm gonna try to start shortening up, giving you a lot of information, but I'm gonna make it a little bit faster. So that way it's a little bit, you know, a little bit easier to listen to. So that way we're not spending hour and a half at a time. We're gonna to try to knock these down to about 45 minutes tops for all of the information that we're gonna give you every Sunday. So just be aware of that. We're gonna to try to shorten us up a little bit, but we are still gonna deliver the same amount of information. So today what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at a couple spots in the New Testament where it talks about Abraham. And then we're gonna look at the progression of faith through his life. So if you don't remember, the progression of faith is really six steps. It's first receiving a promise from God. It's it, whether you hear a spoken word from God or you get it out of the Bible, it's just receiving a promise from God. Faith takes you from that step to step number six, which is receiving the promise. Step number six is receiving. So you hear the word. You receive the manifestation of your promise. God says you are healed by his stripes. You are healed. 1 Peter 2.24, the sixth step, you receive the physical healing. Your body actually becomes healed. So how do you get from there to there? There's four steps in between. So you receive from God the promise. You hear from him. Then your faith is tried in three ways. Try, uh, temptations, tribulations, and persecutions. That's the three trials of the enemy. You must stand, step three, stand in faith. Do not waver, don't move, because if you waver, you won't receive. The fourth step is patience. Faith worketh patience. As your faith is tried, it builds patience in you to wait for the promise. The fifth part is experience. Patience goes to experience. Experience is that level of commitment of seeing God work over and over and over. The more times you stand in patience to get to promises, the more experience you build. And then, the, like I said, the final step is to receive the promise. The promise is the hope. It says patience to experience to hope. So promise, tried, stand, patience, experience, Hope. Hope is the manifestation. Six steps that it takes to go from hearing God's word to being able to receive what God is trying to tell you or receive the actual manifestation of what he's promised you. So we're going to look at Romans first. We're going to read through this a little bit. Like I said, we're going to read a lot of scripture today. But what I want to show you is just different ways in which Abraham is, is a great model of how faith works and how to go from promise to manifestation. So Romans chapter four, we're just going to start in verse one. What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So you can say it the other way, that he that worketh is reckoned of debt and not of grace. Which means if you work, there is a reward or a payment due. But the word right here in the Bible is saying it's reckoned of grace. It's reckoned of grace. Which means you cannot pay for it. You cannot work enough for it to be earned it's free pure free but to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth ungodly his faith is counted for righteousness even as david also described the blessedness of the man unto whom god imputes righteousness without works saying blessed are those they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? 
For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in uncircumcision or in circumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised. That he might be the father of them of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, who he had yet being uncircumcised. Now this is all kinds of confusing if you don't understand what he's talking about. So I want to break this out. When I was young in the faith, I read through this and I was like, this makes no sense. What's he talking about? Circumcision, uncircumcision, faith is counted. And it's Circumcision, the cutting of the foreskin, was a sign of what had already happened. Understand that, church. Circumcision was a sign of something that already was had. Abraham had faith. So God's saying, because you have faith, we're going to do circumcision so that way everybody knows you have faith. This is what it's talking about. Abraham believed God before his foreskin was cut. It was cut as a sign or a seal between him and God of the covenant that they were entering into. But the faith was had beforehand. The faith was had before the work it was not the cutting of the foreskin that caused god or caused abraham or caused any of the promises to come it was the faith that was before it the circumcision the cutting of the foreskin was an act of faith based off of what abraham already believed abraham believed god trusted god loved god and then acted in accordance with those values. Abraham didn't act and hoped his values would line up. His values came first. His principles came first. His trust, his love. All of this came before the act. Now this is important, church. If you think that you must act to receive, you don't understand that faith receives before the act. You act out faith. That's what justifies it. You can say, I believe, but if you won't do it, then you don't believe. If you say, I believe that this chair is going to hold me when I sit down, when you sit down, it should hold you. You don't, you don't say, I believe that chair will hold me if I sit down, and then just never sit down. You don't believe it's going to hold you. Well, why don't you sit down then? You understand what I'm saying, church? The, the act of it comes after the belief of it. But the act justifies you showing that you already believed it. That's what this is talking about. It's saying that Abraham believed God first, then he acted in accordance with his belief, and that justified him saying, oh yeah, if you're willing to do that, you must believe. That's what it's saying. The work doesn't bring the promise. The faith brings the promise. But you act in accordance with it. Because that's how you're justified. Okay. Verse 13, we're going to keep going. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So all these promises came through faith, not of law. And the law is the work part. That means you have to earn it. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. So if you earn it, then the promise is null and void. No promise. It becomes a zero. The promise is made of none effect. If you have to earn it. But it's not by earning it, it's through faith. What's it say? Because the law worketh wrath, for where there, for for where no law is, there is no transgression. And here we go, verse sixteen. 
Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, consider not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither the deadness of Sarah's womb, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that that What he had promised, he was able to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, for us also, to him it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Now that's a lot to read. But there's a, there's a couple main principles you need to understand here. Grace, reward, or recompense comes into your life by faith. Faith is what receives the reward. Faith is what receives the blessing, not the work. That's the first part. When you look at this, who believed in hope, who against hope believed in hope, which means Abraham has never seen it yet. There should, there's no way this is possible because like Abraham doesn't have a Bible. This is, we're about to go back to Genesis. Abraham doesn't have a Bible yet, which means he's having to believe in something where there is absolutely no natural way where it would make sense. It makes no sense that what's about to happen is about to happen. So there, it, everything is against this. But he still believed God. Still believed God. Because what God said, he believed he was able to perform. Being not weak in faith. This is strong biblical faith that even when it doesn't make sense in the natural, it doesn't look like it should happen. There is absolutely no way it will happen in the natural except from God. He still believed. That's the key. The key is that even through everything, Abraham still believed God. And he was fully persuaded. Fully persuaded. Staggered not. Like these words you should be catching on to, church. Because these are solid faith stances. Is that it does not, like Abraham put his feet down and said, I believe God, doesn't matter whether anybody else does or not. I believe God, doesn't matter what the world's circumstances look like. I believe God, I will trust God from now. Like, I'm not moving. I'm not moving off this promise. He's fully persuaded. He staggered not, which means this is how faith looks. Faith is fully persuaded that what God tells you is true. You believe it. You will act in accordance with it. And you will not waver. And you will do it immediately. Immediately. This is how faith works. Church, if you want to see true biblical faith, how to get these promises into your life, this is an example. This is the patriarch of faith, who's the father of us all. Our father Abraham. We're talking about the man that demonstrated what it's like that he didn't have the word of God to stand on in a, in a sense of he didn't have the whole New Testament, the whole Old Testament, all the scriptures, all the testimonies, years of people walking this out. He didn't have that. He had a voice come to him and tell him something and he had to trust God. And we get his name all through the Bible because of it. Let's go to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to look at just a couple little things out of here. 
Abraham's name is scattered so much through the Bible, I could talk about this for four or five hours. But we're going to try to keep this real short today. We're going to look at, we'll start at Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the manifestation of the, the promise. The evidence of things not seen. You're not going to see it yet, but it's okay. Faith will bring it to you. Verse 6, For without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's another foundational verse that we teach out of Hebrews 11. And Hebrews 11 is the hall, the hallmark of faith. This is the, the hall of fame of faith. These are all great men and women of faith that trusted and believed God and received from God because of that. Verse 8, by faith Abraham, when he was called to go into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. It's key number one, obedience. Obedience comes from the seed of belief. What you believe is what you will obey. So let me say it a different way. Disobedience the seed is disbelief. What you don't believe, you will not obey. So let's, let's just think about that. And he went out and not knowing whether he went. Here you go, verse 9. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Skip over to verse 17. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he had received him in a figure. Now, we need to, we need to stop here because this is so... This is so profound this is Abraham Old Testament nobody's been raised from the dead yet and Abraham believed that even if he did the act that was going to justify his faith which did justify his faith because God did stop him and gave him the actual sacrifice and we'll get to that in just a second but Abraham believed that if he went through with killing Isaac and sacrificing him, God would have raised him from the God, I trust you to the point I can't see it. It's against hope. Who against hope believed in hope? Doesn't make sense. Can't see. Like, I don't have it. It's hard to even fathom. I, it just, through all of that, trust, faith in God. Faith is complete trust, firm trust. Trust that doesn't move. It's belief. It's obedience. All of these things culminate to how you get faith to work in your life. People say, I have faith. You, you have faith, but you won't obey God. You don't have faith then. You say, I have faith, but I don't believe that. Then you don't believe God. You don't have faith. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You must believe those two things first. And in belief, it will cause you to obey. Stagger not at the promise of God. Obedience, immediate, straightforward action lining up in accordance with what you believe. This is what Abraham did. Abraham lived a life dedicated to doing exactly what God said. Now, Abraham wasn't perfect. We're going to see that in just a second. But you can see his life is depicted all through the Bible. Telling us how to walk in faith. That when you hear God, when you, when you read the promise of God, you just go. Just go. Cody, it doesn't just go. But it doesn't just go. Believe. Trust. If you understand the love of God, this is going to be a profound truth. And then we're going to look at Abraham's life throughout the Old Testament. 
if you understand how much God loves you, and let me tell you right now, God loves you so much, so, so much. God loves you so much, he sent his only son to die for you, to pay for your sin that demanded punishment of you going to hell. That's what it demanded, and Jesus paid for that. So Jesus, Jesus redeemed you from the curse of the law by paying the price that you could never pay because God loves you. That's why that happened. Jesus said, I don't do anything except what I see the Father do, and I don't speak unless I hear it from the Father. I speak what I hear the Father say, and I do what I see the Father do, which means the Father's actions is, and his, his words is love to you to sacrifice himself for you. The God who created you was willing to die for you. That's they, Hold on and just think about that for a minute. The person who created you was willing to die for you. That's like you creating a robot and then you're willing to die for your robot. I ain't dying for no robot. I created that. I can make another one, right? That's, what, that's how we as carnal... You got to get redeemed from that. That carnal mind of selfishness is against the will of God. It's God's mind. It's the spirit of God that causes you to willfully lay down your life for somebody else. To lay down your life for Jesus. To die daily and pick up your cross and follow him and obey him and serve him and and live this life of Christianity is not because I have to. It's because I want to. And I want to do it because he loved me enough to die for me when he didn't have to. He demonstrated his love first. I demonstrated my love second. That's the difference. I act based off of what he's already done. My faith, when it acts out, when you act out faith, when you speak in faith, when you make confessions, when you walk in faith, when you do things out of what you hear from God, it's not because you're doing it first expecting God to move second. It's that God moved first. You're just reciprocating. You're just responding to what God already did. God's not responding to you. You're responding to him. Your actions are a response to what he already said. Because his words don't come back void. So your act is in accordance with believing and trusting in him. And that all stems from the fact that you believe that he loves you. And if you don't know it today, let me tell you, God loves you. God loves you so much. And he wants to be in a relationship with you and wants to be in your life. So if you are, do not have a personal relationship with Jesus, if you have not got born again, I tell you right now, it's real simple. Just believe that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Just say, Jesus, you are the Lord of my life. I give you all of me so that I can receive all of you. Be the Lord of my life. I will serve you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. You just got born again. God loves you so much. If you prayed that little short prayer and you did get born again, you did receive Jesus, I want you to reach out to me. I'd love to get you some information help help disciple you help help pour into you into your life because god loves you and god wants you to walk a a full purpose filled abundant life and i want to i want to walk you through how that how that looks so let's keep going we're going to look at a couple little things in the book of genesis and we're just going to kind of do some page flips and i just want you to see some things about how abraham lived his life Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of the country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse thee that curse thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord spoke unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was seventy and five years old when he departed from Haran. Seventy and five, so he's seventy-five years old. And Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, 
and all their substance that they gathered and their souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan and to and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abraham passed through the land unto a place called Shechem, and a place unto the plain of Morai. And the Canaanite was in the was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram, and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord, unto unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. So this is this is powerful what it's about to talk about and he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east and there he built an altar unto the Lord and he called upon the name of the Lord and Abraham journeyed going on still toward the south so this is where the promise is coming God is saying I will make you great so all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed because of you that's the first promise it's his seed. The second promise is, I'm going to give your seed the land. This is going to be an inheritance. Now, as we, we look through here, like I said, we're going to page flip. We're going to grab some verses as we go. But I just want you to see what happens chronologically. In the verse 12, you see Abraham going into Egypt and Pharaoh trying to take Sarai, his wife. And this, that whole scenario plays out. And then you have Abraham coming back. It says in this chapter 13, And Abraham went out from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had in Lot with him into the south. Abraham was very rich in cattle. And then as you keep going, it says, verse 7, And there was a strife between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And then this is where they get to pick. And Lot lifted up his eyes, is verse 10, and beheld all the plain of Jordan, it was all well watered everywhere, and the Lord before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou come unto Zorai. And Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Verse 12, Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. And the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Now this is where Abraham is starting to dwell in the land of Canaan. And we look at verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, After that lot was separated from him, Lift up thine eyes and look from the place where thou art north, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it and thy seed forever and I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth so that if a man can number the dust of the earth then shall thy seed also be numbered arise walk through the land in the length of it and the breadth of it and I will give it unto thee and then Abraham removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mer 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 which is in Hebron and built there an altar unto the Lord so now you see another time where God is promising the same thing to Abram. So this is before his name is Abraham. His name is still Abram. And like I said, we're just doing some page flips. And we're just looking at different things. And then we see in chapter 15. So we're going to go, we skip chapter 14. We're just going to go around 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield, and thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Lord God, will thou, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is Eleazar, Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold to me, thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born of my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Thou shalt not be thine heir, but he shall come forth out of thine bowels and shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Here you go, verse 6. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. When God spoke it, Abraham believed it. 
Now, you can see this progression of faith of Abraham over and over and over hearing the promise of God. And not only him hearing it, but his faith being tried. He doesn't have a kid. He's having to wait patiently. The devil's coming at him. You don't have a kid. You don't have a kid. You don't have a kid. Your, your servant's going to take over all your land and be your heir. And you don't have a kid. And, and Abraham is trying to figure this thing out. He's doing what all of we do. He's, he's, he's struggling. He's wrestling to stand on the promise of God. And then you come into verse, and then in chapter 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children, but she had a handmaiden, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. Now if you read through chapter 16, you see where Abram takes his wife's handmaiden, Hagar, and this is where Ishmael comes from. Because Abraham wavered. So he had, he had a problem, he, he struggled, and he slipped up. He made a mistake. Hey, church, let me tell you, it happens. You don't want it to, but sometimes it happens. And listen, there's, there is no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. If you slip up, just pick yourself back up and let's keep going forward. Don't live in sin. You don't want to live in sin. If you love God, you won't want to live in sin. If you have the Holy Ghost living inside of you, he will convict you unto righteousness. He doesn't convict you unto guilt, shame, and condemnation that makes you think that you will never get better. The Holy Spirit of God convicts you under righteousness so that way you can understand your place with God to keep going forward. The only people that lose are the people that quit. If you quit, then you lose. But if you just keep going forward towards God, God will sustain you, take care of you, bless you, and help you to live a holy life. Chapter 17. And when Abram was ninety years and old and nine, the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. I will make my covenant between me and thee, and I and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be the father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, made thee, past tense, already done. Think about that, church. God said, I've already made you a father of many nations. Abram didn't even have the promised child yet. But God said, I already made you. Why? Because the promise is sure. God's word doesn't come back void. It's a matter of us living a life of faith to receive it. Because if we will receive it, that word will produce. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto them, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. And then the next part is where it talks about circumcision. Abraham believed. Abraham believed first. Then he acted out the process of doing the circumcision. We're not going to read through that because we got a lot to go through. we got a couple more chapters, but we want to flip. Verse 15, and, and God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai, thy wife, her, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall, she be, shall her name be. And I will bless her, and I will give thee a son of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old, and shall Sarah, that is ninety years old, bear? And Abram said unto God, O oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Here's what God said. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed after him. God's reinforcing this point of the seed 
the seed, the promised child, is Isaac. Now, if you read verse 18, 18 goes right into the point before Sodom and Gomorrah is destroyed. During chapter 18, you see that God, Abraham, two angels sitting at the tent door eating, and Sarah is making food for them. And the tea of the day. And this is where Abraham has a conversation with God about not destroying the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the conditions, and they have this, this full conversation. You should go back and read it. It's very powerful. And what you see is that Sarah just doesn't believe. But God is saying it over and over and over. I promise this. It's going to come to pass. I promise this. It's going to come to pass. And then you see in chapter 20, Abraham having the same struggle and wrestle with it where he tells Sarah, hey, just say you're my sister so Abimelech doesn't kill me when we go through his city. All over again, God redeems them, saves them, protecting them. And chapter 21, And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord said unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. So this is where you see Isaac come up. And then what we'll see, we'll look at verse, we'll look at chapter 20. And then we will go ahead and wrap up for today and it came to pass after these things that god did tempt abraham and said unto him abraham and he said behold here i am and he said take thy son thine only son isaac whom thou lovest and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which i tell of thee and abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went to the place of which God had told him. And then we are going to look at verse 15. We're going to skip down to verse 15. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of the heaven the second time and said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Now, I'm going to wrap this up because we have looked at a ton of scripture today. But I'm going to give you the, the summary. We're going to look at the summary of it. We've talked about how that Abraham believed God. He obeyed God. He acted in faith according to what he already believed. All of the actions that Abraham did came because of what he believed first. Faith was acted out to receive from God. God said there's rest. Abraham believed the chair would hold him. Abraham sat down in the chair. Abraham got rest. That's a, that's a very simplistic way of thinking of this, but that's how this process works. So what you see is God speaks to Abraham, tells him, I'm going to bless thee, father of many nations. I'm going to give you the land. And then Abraham goes through life standing in faith, believing this promise, seeing that God is faithful and he doesn't have his promise yet and he just keeps standing and he slips up and he falls and he makes some mistakes so he's not a perfect example. He can't. He's not the only perfect example is Jesus. But he slips up, he makes some mistakes but he stands back up in faith and just keeps going after God. God's speaking the same word over and over and over and over to him. And then he receives his son. And not only does he receive his son, now his faith is tried again to whether he will care more about the blessing over the blesser. Care more about the gift over the giver. Abraham doesn't. He's willing to put the gift on the altar. Because of that, it's accounted for righteousness. He's blessed again. His faith is completely justified. 
because he cares more about the person that is blessing him, the person, than the actual blessing itself. Abraham cares more about the healer, about the provider, about the giver, than he does about any of the actual gifts, blessings, or provisions that come from it. It's more about the person. Abraham believed God. And you see a whole life of faith, of just over and over and over, God speaks. God says, offer up your son Isaac, Abraham, the next morning, rose early, goes to do what God said. Church, this is so powerful. And I, I hope this blesses you as much as it blesses me. And I know we flipped through this very quickly today. Because there's so much we could talk about when it comes to Abraham, our father Abraham. And we just you just flip through the pages and look at his life story. You see a, a life of faith. And the land of Canaan is where Abraham and his wife and Isaac and his wife all buried. You, 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 see, you see Abraham buried in the land that God promised. And when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, when Moses led them out, Joshua, 40 years after the wilderness, after the wilderness for 40 years, Joshua led them into the land of Canaan, the promised land. And it said there was so many people. They were innumerable like the sand of the seashore. Everything God promised came to pass. But it took Abraham believing and walking in faith to receive the promise of God. So if I can encourage you with anything, church, if you would like to receive from God, promises from God, first receive his love. His love will allow you to trust him and believe him. And when you trust and believe in God because he loves you, you'll have faith. And your faith will act in accordance with it and it will receive from God. It will not be a work that earns it. It will be your response to him that causes the reception of the promise into your life. So church, I encourage you again. Remember, we have a faith conference coming up next month. And we're going to be talking about these subjects more and more. Lives of faith, Abraham, different patriarchs. We're going to be looking at faith as a whole. We're going to be talking about how to receive from God. And then remember, please make sure you're, you're sowing seed. We, we do appreciate that very much, and we, we definitely want to plant that and have God bless you in a mighty way. So let me pray for you. Father, I pray that you bless this church in Jesus' name. I command every attack of the enemy to cease right now in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray every blessing, provision, prosperity in their lives come to an abundance in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for it. We give you all the praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, have a wonderful day.